the yearly occurrence, me coming on here to summarize and explode on what's been another failed season. You know, I didn't do one of these in 2022 because it wasn't a failed season. We didn't have Kawhi and we fought really hard. 2021, I mean, I did a version of this video, but it was with a much more positive tone because we broke the first uh, second round curse that for a second I thought we'd never break. This was year 19 for me as a Clipper fan. My first year as a season ticket holder. My second year as host of Locked On Clippers. And the biggest growth in my channel thus far. The most money I've made talking about the Clippers. And just the most involved I've ever been with the team. Before I get into this season and everything that it's meant for me. And what it's done to me as a fan. And the feelings I have about our stars and the direction of this franchise and how I'm feeling internally after another year of content, that'll all be coming out here and it's going to get fiery. So I will let you know to proceed with caution. If you don't want to hear the truth, if you don't want to hear some stuff that's going to be uncomfortable, then just exit the video right now. If you're a stan of the four stars and future Hall of Famers on our roster and you can't take the heat, then get the fuck out right now because it's about to get hot in this kitchen. Before we can talk about this season, we got to talk about last season. And last season was a season where we started with the expectation of Kawhi's back, we're going all the way. We have a 42-win team, and we missed Paul George for 51 games. We missed Kawhi for 82 games. We're going to get them back. We're going all the way. And we just let a season wallow away until Kawhi Leonard got hurt. And after we got Russell Westbrook and Bones Highland and Mason Plumley and these guys in the middle of the season, we still didn't get to reap the benefits of what a new, a true new Clipper team looked like in the playoffs because Kawhi got hurt. And after the season, after that complete waste of my time, after the stress it caused me because I still believed, I said, you know what? Because this shit is not winning a championship. And if you fool yourself into believing that these guys are going to magically stay healthy next year, let's run it back and do it all over again, then you're fucking delusional and if we do stay healthy and this video ages as poorly as the last one did where look in 2021 paul george did prove me wrong he did make it out of the second round we did break that curse if these guys prove me wrong and they win the championship and stay healthy for a whole playoff run i would be the happiest person in the world to be wrong but this ain't fantasy land my brother and sisters this ain't fantasy land this shit is cooked and the better we move off these guys the, the um the quicker we move move off these guys the better and I know the biggest concern. We're moving into the Intuit Dome in two years, and Bomber wants to have stars to headline the arena. Well, listen, man. What's the point of having stars if they're not going to play? We got to blow it up. Everybody forgot about my video last season. Everybody forgot how I truly felt. Because when it's obvious we're not blowing it up, now I have to shift into, okay, I have a job now as the host of a podcast, as a fan that likes to be a voice for the fans. And I can't just be doom and gloom and keep telling you guys that we're never going to win in this era because I don't think Kawhi is going to stay healthy. I could not keep saying that to you guys every week, even though I felt it the entire time. I said to blow it up, but we didn't want to listen. And the reason why I said that is because I knew that this era was cooked, right? Because one, I didn't think, I'll tell you, I had two suspicions. One, that maybe Paul George and Kawhi can't win together. And it's because Paul George is not who we think he is or who people think he is. And then this, the main reason is because Kawhi, I don't trust his health, right? Those two reasons were the main reasons that I wanted the team blown up. And to do it a year before the Intuit Dome, so we get this last year at Staples Center of ushering in what's going to be the new era going into the Intuit Dome, so we're not faced with the very problem that we have now and that we are going to be addressing in this video. And last season, I checked out in the sense that I don't expect anything from this era anymore. I'm not going to get hyped. But then... Something happened. We got Russell Westbrook, who is one of my favorite players of all time, but I didn't want him. I was convinced that the Lakers had shown me he wasn't good at basketball anymore. He had no jump shot. Teams sag off of him and go underneath screens on him, which kills his pick and roll threat. They sag off of him when he doesn't have the ball, and defensively his effort was inconsistent, and his IQ, he still thinks he's that guy. These were all the reasons I didn't want Russ. But when I had to force... Because I didn't believe that Russ could play a big role in a team that has championship aspirations. But granted, you know, in his defense, he's never played on a big three that really fit him. Because LeBron and AD, despite the injuries to Anthony Davis, LeBron and him together, 
I personally think Russell Westbrook and this experience with Harden has even further confirmed this belief to me that this version of Russell Westbrook that has lost his athleticism should not be playing with another ball dominator. He should not in any way. So Russell Westbrook, we were we gave him the keys basically last year, and I said, you know what? I'll give him a chance because he's my guy. And I experienced a lot of fun again. He gave us the life, the energy, the leadership vocally that we were lacking. A little bit of athleticism and downhill rim pressure that we were lacking. But then in the summer, all of a sudden, I started hearing Clipper fans on social media saying, going from all we need is Kawhi healthy to we don't have enough. We don't have enough. Like We got to get a third star. We got to get a third star. And I'm like, whoa. Like, where did this come from? I thought you guys were the ones that kept saying to me that all we need is Kawhi healthy and we're going to win the whole thing. Or we're going to have a great chance. But now all of a sudden we need a third star. When did this begin? And then all of a sudden the name that everybody kept saying, James Harden. If you followed me for a while, you know that I'm not a huge fan of old plumber Jim or James Harden. Now, this season I've had to deal with the most stands and haters I've ever experienced in my life. People getting so personal, you know, Sometimes I'll wake up and, you know, I'll check Twitter and stuff. And the first thing I see in the morning is someone calling me all a bunch of names because of what I said about James Harden and this and that. And I'm not going to lie. It can get to you. You know, I still don't make a ton of money from this that it's like, you know, I still work a job in the daytime. I still have multiple gigs to make money. You know, I wake up and see people attacking me over basketball take. And it's just like sometimes I'm like, man, is this shit worth it? Like just getting attacked. It's like it's really hard to start your mornings that way. You know, you know that you're, you're just, you just, this is just your basketball opinion. Like, but people are very sensitive and stands, you know, can quite frankly, since this is my last video, I can say whatever I want. Suck my fucking dick. All of them. All right. Except for the, you know, the 1%. But my point is, I'm going to give you characteristics of basketball players that I don't like. And then I'm going to give you characteristics of basketball players that I do like. I don't like guys that don't move without the ball. I don't like guys that constantly dominate the ball. I don't like guys that over dribble. I don't like guys that only shoot threes and layups. And I don't like guys that don't put all their effort on the defensive end. And I don't like guys that aren't super vocal leaders. Here's what I do like in the game of basketball. I like good passers. I like good ball handlers. High IQ players. I like mid-range guys. I like post-up bigs. I like guys that are willing to not give a shit about their stats. And more importantly, I like guys that do the little things. So James Harden crosses off in the good category there, can pass, pretty high IQ, shifty, can handle the ball. But a lot of those negative characteristics I listed, James Harden also fits into that. And you know what? It's not just James Harden. LeBron, Luka, Trey Young, you know, a lot of these guys, these, these heliocentric ball dominators, I don't like that style of play. I don't think those players are ever going to win anything unless you have the size advantage of a Luka and LeBron where you can just constantly body people as well and get two feet in the paint kind of whenever you want. But those guards that do it, they're not winning anything to me. And James Harden is no different. So I actually used to love James Harden when he was in uh, Oklahoma City. But then Mike D'Antoni got him, and then I realized maybe I hate... And when we got James Harden and I started reflecting on the whole thing, I started realizing that my beef with Mike D'Antoni is even bigger than Harden. I think that heliocentric, put the ball in one guy's hands and make them run pick and roll and make them a statistical god is such... Awful basketball if you want to win a championship. What it does is it, what it does is is it empowers one guy to dribble and do everything in terms of shot creation for your team. It's a very efficient way to get shots when he's surrounded by the right personnel, but it stagnates ball movement, hinders overall rhythm and development, in my opinion, and is easy to guard when the defense knows where the where the shot is coming from, where the creation is coming from, and can put 10 eyes behind the ball. James Harden failed over and over again in Houston for a variety of reasons, some bad luck, some self-inflicted, and Kobe Bryant even said that that style of play will never win. He goes to Brooklyn, and first of all, I didn't like the way he exited Houston. You know, I, I, I like John Wall and DeMarcus Cousins, and the way they were talking about how James Harden was not professional, and I get it. You've given everything to that city. You want to leave, but you know, you could go about it a little bit more respectful, brother. And, and for Calvin Murphy, a, a former Rockets legend, to say when the camera cuts, and we can still hear it though, that he quit, when a former legend of the Rockets is saying that he quit, I lose a little bit of respect. Then he goes to Brooklyn, asks out because, of course, you know, Kyrie doesn't, you know, is not vaccinated. The whole front office is being weird. So he requests a trade after he asked to go there a year prior and then basically tanks in the game against Sacramento when he's on his way out of Brooklyn. Like, 
almost like he's not even trying out there. Like he's trying to please get me traded because I don't want to just make a blatant request until it's too late, until it's like very obvious that I'm trying to leave. Like that's just not that's just not cool to me. And then the playoffs in 2022 and 2023 where he went out sad like he didn't even try. So you mix all those things in. The foul baiting, I forgot to mention that as a negative. You mix all those things in and you think I want that guy? You think I want that player who I think is the, you know, who I have said is everything wrong with modern basketball? It has nothing to do with him personally. I was in the same gym as James Harden this year. I have nothing bad to say about him as a person. But I don't think he's ever going to win a championship because when you give him the keys, the system, everything he wants to do, what you're doing is you were essentially saying you're going to handle the ball the most. And everyone's going to say, get, throw some stat at me about how the, these efficient offenses he's led and all that. You know how many championship offenses he's led? Zero. And I'll tell you part of why. Because you put the ball in his hands and that's all he's great at is he's a pick and roll god at this stage. His isolations for the most part take way too long. And when he's not creating advantages in pick and roll on the ball, he does nothing else to help your team. He's constantly on ball because when he's off the ball, his only thing that he brings to the table is that he can shoot, catch, and shoot threes, which he is efficient at but also not always willing to take. He loves nothing more, and he did the same shit in game six, than to take a rhythm dribble and let the defender recover to take a contested three instead of open. And then he doesn't move off the ball at all. And then defensively, he's extremely pick and choose. And because he gets a couple of steals and tries a little bit, it gets everyone to say, well, Harden wasn't that bad defensively. Guys, our, our standards subconsciously lower for him. What he does does not always help everyone. It stagnates ball movement. It stagnates pace. We already had a slow team. We had a slow team that lacked athleticism. And we said James Harden was the answer to that. Are you being serious? I said this wasn't going to move the needle versus Denver. But you know what everyone told me? James Harden, third option. James Harden, third option. He did it in Brooklyn. All this. And, you know, I'm just going to go with my gut. It's a valid point that James Harden has not failed, quite frankly, as a third option in, since OKC. You know, that was a while ago. But I'm telling you right now, I just have a gut. A gut feeling that that style of play, giving Harden the ball and letting him cook, letting him be the system, is never going to win a championship, man. It's, it's never going to happen for him. I just don't believe that he's got it, what it takes. And, you know, it's funny. People are going to say, oh, he did okay in the Dallas series. You know, we'll talk about that in a sec. But that's just Dallas. What about Minnesota? What about the other teams that are going to have bigger defenders for him? You know, I mean... To me, it was just so pointless. So let me just explain the, the feeling when we got James Harden. Because the only thing that was saving me from like, okay, I have to buy in one more year with this team. We don't want to give up on Kawhi and Paul George after just four years. Because the biggest regret would be to give up on these guys and watch them go to another team and ball out. And Kawhi stays healthy for another playoff run and whatnot. The only thing that was keeping me sane and getting these season tickets was, one, the price was insane. So I got a great deal on the tickets for 207 And Russell Westbrook, I was like, you know what? We got one of my favorite players of all time. Have a full season of him. Ty Lue hopefully will stop being a bot this year. Play Robert Covington. Play Terrence Mann more. And we're hopefully going to have a good season. And we'll see if Kawhi and Paul can stay healthy. But my whole thing was this. Don't make a trade for a third star to save these guys. Let them play and see if the vision that we built this team, which was Kawhi and Paul and, and role players, is good enough to win. Don't give them an exit door. Don't give them an excuse. Let them play. And you know what? Those first three games, I know we lost to Utah, but those first three games, I was having so much fun because my focus then went from, okay, I wanted this era gone, but now I'll give anything to keep this era. Just please don't put James Harden on my basketball team. Please don't put James Harden on my basketball team. Because here's what I thought would happen. He's going to make us better, right? I don't know what's going to happen to Russ. I, I, I thought that was going to be a horrible pairing. That was my biggest fear. We're going to get James Harden. He's going to make Paul George even less uh, uh, aggressive. And we're going to do better in the regular season, only to flame out harder in the playoffs with a three-star team. And then we gave up something for Harden, and we have nowhere to go. Oh, I wasn't that far off. We get James Harden, and when I saw that Woj bomb, my heart literally sank. I'm telling all of you right now, all the commentary, all the talk we had throughout the year, everyone I did a post-game interview with, everyone I talked to at the stadium, just know that my enthusiasm was all for a game-to-game -game basis. I never believed we could win the championship with this guy. 
I have to put on like belief in the shows that I do, but like I don't think James Harden is going to win anything, and I'm going to stand by that strong. There's nothing you can say that changes my mind. There's no stat, no nothing you can say that changes my mind. I have nothing against the guy personally. I actually think he was arguably our best performer in the first round. He actually gave us two fantastic games without Kawhi and was asked to do more than he needed to do. That being said, I'm not here to, you know, watch James Harden try over and over to get his ring that he's never gotten. I just, I'm not here for that shit. Trump's try someone else. But when we got him, man, my whole world crumbled. Like, I just was like, I can't believe I have to root for this. We're not going to win, and now I have to put up with this. So I went to fucking Austin, Texas to hang out with my boys from college, and I started binge drinking, dude. I just started drinking over and over. And I was like, like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, this, that was the moment I realized that none of this shit is worth it. It's never worth it to care so much. Because no matter what, you just don't have an effect on this shit. You can believe that Harden's never going to win anything and that this 2-1-3 era needs to fail outright for the front office to see that maybe they're not what they're cut out to be. But they went and got James Harden and took one last swing, giving up another first-round pick and a fan favorite in Nico and, of course, Rocco. But, you know, those guys, we didn't end up giving much in terms of what they gave to the Sixers. So now let's talk about how the season went. The first conversation was what's going to happen with Russ when Harden comes? What's going to happen? And I was trying to advocate for Russ to start. Now, let me just defend that for a sec. The reason why I was saying that is because I'm a big believer of you got to lose your spot. If you're doing everything right, you can't just get replaced. Now, people are going to argue with me and say, dude, it was three games. Russ is not a starting point guard for a contender. Get real. Here's what I'll say to that. Why are you guys, all you people that are so anti-Westbrook being a starter on anything, why did you guys stay so quiet? In the you know when we got him and stuff, I'm guessing it's because you're doing the same thing I'm doing with Harden. It's like you're just going with the flow because you have nothing to, you can you can't change it. But like if that's the case, then fine. You believe that Russ won't win us anything. I believe that Harden won't win us anything. I think Harden's better than Russ, obviously, but I just think both of them are flawed. You know, come playoff time in many ways, and I'm gonna talk more about Russ in a sec. But so we we I just didn't know what to, where to go. It's like. I believe that Russ needed to be demoted because I knew what was going to happen. I'm sorry. I believe that Russ needed to lose his spot by playing poorly before he got demoted because I know Russell Westbrook and he's a very, not personally, but I know who he is as a player and he's very emotional and he's very rhythm based. His role was perfect for him. He's the starting point guard around two stars that are primarily going to work off the ball, going to work quickly off the catch. They can negate some of the bad spacing with their contested mid-range shot making, and he can cut off of them and then be a screen setter for them and be a trigger man for them, but still doesn't take the ball away from them too much to keep them aggressive. To me, it was a perfect balance. He added to our defense and added to pace that we sorely lacked. So to me, he was actually a great fit next to those guys. But instead, we wanted to get slower and older for a guy that's better in the half court and that can shoot threes and can shoot in general. Pick and roll God, James Harden. But what happens then? We move Westbrook to the bench. That unlocked our whole season. But that whole time I knew, and I kept saying to people that said this is the perfect role for Russ, it is not. Because when Russ comes in with this shortened role, he's so eager to make an impact. Because that's the thing about Russ, and it's a total flaw in him as a player, and that it's hard to adapt with him. And you saw it this playoffs. In this role of coming off the bench, and you saw it when he started against Phoenix a couple weeks ago, he looks like a different player. The thing about Russ is you need to let him live through his mistakes and work through them. He's going to miss layups. He's going to turn the ball over. But if you give him enough of a chance, in my opinion, and this is a huge minority, and I'm going to get clowned for this, and I don't give a fuck. He will do some great things to overcome that. There will be some games, though, where you're like, you just got to sit him. You just got to sit him to close games. But I still think there's much more left in the tank than we saw. But in that role, and again, this is totally you can blame Russ for it. He feels like he needs to make an impact any way necessary, any, by any means necessary. And that means go 100 miles per hour and try to score. And when he's out there with Harden, he's constantly off ball. And the defense will just sag off of him and load up as Harden and Paul George pound the ball away or Kawhi. This, I mean, part of my bitterness towards Harden too is that we replaced one of my favorite players ever who I was so down with after not being down to have him with one of my least. And I was supposed to be like happy with that because I saw that, you know, what was happening with Russ and how it wasn't going to end well. And I was supposed to like be cool with this. I'm not going to lie, guys. It was the weirdest experience I've ever had as a fan this year. The toughest year of my fandom. All it did was show me how much I can't stand James Harden's game. 
I couldn't root for him. I, at times, I didn't even know if I wanted him to make shots, which is so weird sounding. It sounds terrible as a fan to even say that. But I'm like, and, and I asked, you know, when I was really, like, when we were at the first seed and he was cooking and stuff and I still wasn't enjoying it. And I kept telling people behind the camera, I was like, I, I'm not enjoying this. Like, I don't feel like it's real. I feel like, I can't celebrate too early. I don't feel confident in Kawhi's body. I don't feel confident in Harden in the playoffs. And people are like, just enjoy it, man. You're, you're thinking too much and all this. And I'm so happy I didn't let myself, you know, buy into it. I'm so happy that I stayed true to my heart and my gut and knew that this was just not going to be it. Just didn't feel like it. It's never felt like it for me. I feel like I've seen so, you know, people have this belief that, oh, because you're a Clipper fan, you don't know what it's like to win a championship. But what they don't understand is I've been in Los Angeles and watched Laker games when they've won championships. I watch every game of the playoffs. I know what championship tendencies are like. I study the NBA champions from the 60s, for God's sake. And never have I felt like we've had a championship team in my life, ever. And I feel like when we have that team, I will know it. I will feel it. And this was never that. And I never think a team with James is going to win a championship. And, you know, for all those wondering, what about Paul? What about Paul? I was giving Paul a chance this year because in 2020, he fucked up. In 2021, he redeemed himself and he hasn't played in the playoffs since. But as I was saying, in that winning streak, I was still feeling so weird. I just, I, I didn't, I, I, it was the first time in my life where I didn't care if we lost games. And when we won, I didn't even care either. I, it's, it sounds so awful as a fan. And, you know, all it made me realize, and when we got the number one seed, I, like, looked deeply and reflected, and I just started tearing up one time when I saw a journal entry, a literal journal entry in fourth grade in my, in my class, in my school class, and me saying, I'm a Clipper fan, I love going to games, and I want to see us win a championship one day. It was 2008 when I said that. That was before Blake Griffin or anyone. And here I am now in 2024, living the dream, getting paid to talk about my team. And I'm out here like not even rooting for them to win like that anymore because of James Harden, because of one guy that I can't stand the way he plays, even though he's balling for my team. It was the weirdest internal conflict I'd ever faced. And I was like, get over it, bro. I'm telling myself, get over it, dude. Like get over your hate for, for the way this guy plays. He's helping your team. And then there's a voice inside my head that's like, bro, but you know it's not going to end well. You know it's not. And then I talked to some of my other you know, friends that, not Clipper fans, that, that hated Harden. And I'm like, I asked him a question. I said, do you think we'd have more respect for him if he was a champion? And he said, of course we would. You wouldn't say anything that you say about him if he had won. And I was thinking to myself, and I'm like, you're fucking right. So if James Harden just performs in the playoffs, then I'm cool with him. And, and when we get, when we get to the conference finals, I'm cool with him. So I gave him that chance for the rest of the season. But let me just tell you this, man. It was so hard to watch him. Even when he's cooking, I can't stand watching him hoop. I think he's amazing. He's a Hall of Famer. He's great. He's never going to win a chip, in my opinion. And I can't stand watching him. I want him off my team tomorrow. Um, now, late in the season, we start showing tendencies. And remember what I said all season? If we're not a top three seed, we will not win a ring. And guess who was right yet again? And part of everyone's going to say, health, health. You know, Usually the top three seeds are healthy for most of the year. Just, you know, just something that happens in history. But we were not a top three seed. And the funny part is, all season we were healthy. That's the craziest part. Kawhi Leonard, 68 games. I was knocking on this fucking wood all season. Paul George, 73 games. James Harden, Russell Westbrook, obviously had the hand injury. They played all these games. And we still didn't finish top three. Because we ran out of legs. Because we were old. Because we got run off the floor. In some games, they didn't even look like they cared. Because they had no legs. And because Paul George does not play like a star half the time. <laughs> you didn't even finish top four and you traded for Harden. That's when I was completely off this team. When that happened, my mood completely changed. I was like, fuck these guys. Like, you made that trade for Harden, and I said it didn't move the needle, and it didn't. And you know what I majorly said was, if the, Kawhi and Paul aren't healthy, why are we trading for a third star? Why are we going all in when those two haven't held up their end of the bargain from a health perspective? You think I'm mad at Kawhi and Paul for getting hurt? Shit happens. But you know who I'm mad at? Everyone. From the top down. And it's time to go into it. It's not, it doesn't mean shit that we lost this game against Dallas. It doesn't mean anything. Because we had to win another series without the fucking franchise player who we sold our entire future for. Let's begin with who should be held accountable. Starting with our coach. 
Ty, you know, I will have to acknowledge that he has not had the ideal circumstances in any year. He has not had a fully healthy team, and that's bullshit, okay? But there are a couple things that he needs to be held accountable for. One, he had no development of Ivica Zubats offensively for years. We've seen him make strides in the post every season, but no, you want to stick to pick and roll in isolation for our best players. Not good enough. Secondly, that bumbling oaf Mason Plumley who after the injury against New York this season showed nothing good. We made our whole run of 26-5 and five with Daniel Tice. And by the way, that 26-5 and five run, 10 games were played against non-playing teams, by the way. So when well, you want to tell me we look like a championship team, no, we did not. You know, we look like, okay, in your opinion, we did against regular season competition. That is not, you know, 30 games is not a sample size that convinces me you're a championship team. No sample size of regular season basketball convinces me that someone's a championship team. But you know what does a little bit? A top three seed. So I wasn't going to fucking take victory laps in February. Like the rest of you talking about the system, getting in my fucking mentions about how great this is. Apologize to Harden. What the fuck have we won? What the fuck have we won? Talking about victory laps in December, in January. Are you insane? You're so worried about a gotcha moment with a fucking 25-year-old guy that does content than living your own lives. Why don't you start your own platform and start talking? Maybe somebody will listen to your boring ass. Talking about, oh, apologize. Apologize for what? For saying we wouldn't win a championship with this guy? For, for you know, to, to apologize to Kawhi and Paul for saying blow it up? You know, all year I thought that my take was going to age poorly about blowing it up because they would never stay healthy. All year I thought it would. And what happens yet again? But I'm not done with Ty Lue. So that bumbling oaf Plumley was playing in the playoffs instead of Daniel Tice, who, you know, I'm not saying that was the needle mover. We were not going to win the series with Tice over Plumley. That, that would not have won us the series without Kawhi. But the fact that he got no burn after he was part of our amazing run uh, was nonsense. And then PJ Tucker is your answer. By the way, part of the reason why our season went down the drain is one, because Russ got hurt in the regular season, and two, he just randomly started trying PJ Tucker because he cried his way into the rotation. Have some fucking backbone. You got bullied by Marcus Morris, and now you're getting bullied by PJ Tucker. I thought you were the guy that held players accountable. What is that all about? But that's all I have to say about Ty Lue. If I'm being honest with you, I would like Ty Lue back with a different team around him. I would. I don't want the Lakers to get him. I still think he's a good coach. And, like, to me, everyone blames coaches entirely too much. Suns fans, Laker fans, every modern NBA fan base blames coaches too much. You motherfuckers think you can coach a team and you say the same recycled bullshit in every single team, every fan base. No rotations. I can't believe he didn't play this guy more. He runs no offensive sets. He doesn't know when to call timeouts. He doesn't know how to coach. He doesn't make any adjustments. You guys couldn't even drop a fucking play for 10-year-olds talking about that shit. Ty Lue deserves blame, but all you pussies don't want to blame these millionaire players because you have fucking man crushes on them, so you want to blame coaches at every fucking uh, problem. Ch Charles Barkley was right about what he said. Not necessarily about Darvin Ham and Vogel not deserving any blame, but he was right that all you motherfuckers go to coaching first thing. You're the same type of motherfuckers that blame other teammates when you played like fucking ass. Ducking accountability. No, I actually coach at a small level. It's not easy to be an NBA coach with these fucking grown millionaires making excuses and being injured all the time. That's just not easy. And now let's talk about the guy who I've been so patient with. But it's time to pack your fucking bags and also get some, you know, Rogaine or something, buddy. Lawrence Frank. Let's begin. You made the move to get Kawhi and Paul George. You were seen as a god for that, as you should have been, because that was the biggest move in Clipper history to get. But then you have fumbled majorly along the margins since then. Let's begin with the... Oh, this falls to 2-1-3, and I'm going to grill the fuck out of them. But... These absolute chumps that want a point guard so bad to alleviate responsibility from them got us to sign John Wall's corpse instead of re-signing a starting center on what's going to be an Eastern Conference Finals team in a week and a half. You let Isaiah Hartenstein go for John Wall. On top of that, you were naive enough to believe you could go a whole season without a backup center. 
You sign Kennard to a pretty hefty contract of $16 million a year and then traded him in a season that was clearly not going to be a championship for the corpse of Eric Gordon and the pick that ended up being Cam Whitmore. You're seeing the age on our roster and you're trading away assets when you've already traded everything to the Thunder. And then you give in to the players begging for Westbrook on television even though you never believed in him. You sign the poor guy and make it seem like you're reviving his career. You're going to let him be the point guard. And then all summer long, you're looking to replace him. You know... This Ty Lue and Lawrence Frank not being on the same page, how can Kennard be getting so much money when Ty Lue barely used him? How can you value Terrence Mann so highly when Ty Lue has shown you he does not care about him like you do? It's over for Ty Lue and Lawrence Frank together. The fact that we ran it back knowing that they were not on the same page is absolute lunacy from Balmer. And he deserves accountability too, but I'm going to get into him at the end. It's time for Lawrence Frank to go. In addition to all that, he traded for James Harden instead of what I thought he should have done, which was stay patient and see how the season went on. If Kawhi and Paul can stay healthy and you're still not good enough, where are you lacking? Do we miss a big four? Do we really need shot creation and lack a point guard? Do we need more athleticism? Or do we just need a third star in general because they're not pulling their weight? But you didn't wait. You panicked, and you gave up the only thing that we had in assets besides like Brandon Boston and Terrence Mann, and that was all the expiring contracts that we could have used for something else. But instead, you wanted to get an aging, slow pick-and-roll merchant point guard that, yeah, is going to always raise your regular season ceiling, but he's not winning a championship to me. And then you made no moves on the margins in the trade deadline because you were so comfortable, even though we blatantly lacked a, fo a bigger forward after we traded all of them away for Harden. You have failed miserably. You know, Amir Coffey, he was not built to get as many minutes as he was getting in the playoffs either. And then Westbrook completely failed in his role miserably. So let's talk about Westbrook real quick. Okay, he was absolute dog shit in the playoffs, and he has major holes as a basketball player. Can't shoot a lick. His, his effort, the problem with Russ is everything changes for him when he's not getting the role that he particularly wants. And, you know, he showed flashes here and there this season of, I'm going to buy in, I'm going to be cool with this. But the fact of the matter I've learned from him is he cannot be a backup point guard. He needs to be working through his mistakes and either have a team of, of bad players that he can lead to 30 wins and a bunch of great stats and not win anything thing or he needs to be with two stars that work quickly off the catch and be given the keys you know for all the people that are saying what you think our record would have been with Russ Westbrook I don't think it would have been better than Harden in the regular season but I do think that we would have played an entirely different way I think it would have been much more defensive oriented push the pace I think it would have really helped Terrence Amir and Paul George in many ways to get out and run I don't think James Harden favors anyone on this roster to help besides Kawhi and Zoo I think he plays a slow style of basketball and James Harden and Kawhi play a slow, methodical style, and it just doesn't fit Westbrook at all, and it hurt Terrence Mann, making him a spot-up guy more than he needed to be this year, and went through a crazy slump, and Amir Coffey, who is also very good in transition. You know, these guys in the half court constantly doesn't show their the best of their abilities. So this whole thing about Harden makes everyone better and all this and that. No, he doesn't. He just gets you more open shots. He ball pounds way too much for me. And, and, and Russell Westbrook was majorly affected by this. That being said, Westbrook deserves accountability for being so hard to fit into things unless you cater everything to him. And when people say, you're okay, Darian, we do what you want. Okay, Dime, we have Westbrook start. We're not winning shit. That's totally fine if you have that take. But I personally believe if we had tested that theory out without Harden in the beginning of the season with our former roster, you would have come to the conclusion that Paul George is a bigger problem than Russ. And that's what I always wanted everyone to see. So now that brings me to Paul. Actually, I'm going to go to Harden first. I don't have much else to say about Harden. I've talked about him enough in this video. I just don't want him back because, you know, when you see what I say about other guys, you're going to realize there's no point of having him back. I'm not paying James Harden 30 plus million. And Kawhi Leonard, you know, being injured, that... Is not going to make me be, be like, oh, well, you know, Harden just needs Kawhi there. Like, no, I'm not giving. Like, you think I'm here to, you know, be uh, like give James Harden more chances to win championships after he's already shown he's going to underperform like so many times? Fuck that, dude. It's not about the Clippers. I'm a basketball fan first. And that's what everyone needs to understand. I don't give a fuck about this team in the grand scheme of things when it comes to versus basketball. I live and breathe this shit. It's a lifelong obsession. It's more than a game to me. It is not just, oh, it's just my favorite team of grown men and that's it. Like, no. 
This game means everything to me. People are saying, why don't you like Harden? You know, he's been good for your team. It's not about my team. It's about basketball, and I don't like what he's done to the game. Anyway, that's all I have to say about Russ and, and Harden. Russ, I would like to keep him on the cheap, but he has to start. If he's not a starter, then bye. Uh, I don't know where, where he's supposed to go. It was fun having him on the team, but not really with the way we treated him. I feel very sorry for him, and I think that he wasn't—he shouldn't have been subject to this nonsense. And everyone's going to say, oh my God, really? Yes, really. I'm sorry that I knew who Russell Westbrook was as a player, and you didn't. Sorry. I, did, I expected this the whole way. I knew Russ's flaws. And that's why I would take a lot of point guards over him all the time for adaptability purposes. Sorry. Anyway, let's talk about the real problem. The real problem elephant in the room Kawhi Leonard look I said last year I, 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 I've I tried so hard to love this guy I have tried so hard and this year I tried even harder and finally I got to be used to him being at the games and, and playing consistently and I was like oh my god Like, is, is this really about to happen this year Like, is it really about to happen but I was never and when I say it, I mean him playing in the playoffs. And I was never, like, ready for it to happen. I was just like, I can't, I got to see it to believe it. And, man, let me just say this. Five years in, four consecutive seasons, we have watched our season come to an end because Kawhi wasn't healthy. It's not his fault. I don't think he, I don't think he doesn't want to be out there. But enough's enough. Enough's enough. When we got this guy... I legit thought it was like the best day of my life as a sports fan. It was like one of the best days of my actual life. I was so happy. I couldn't believe it. And after the bubble, I was so embarrassed. I mean, you know, this guy with his preferential treatment all season and the commercials and, you know, the arrogance that the Clippers had that season and they deservedly got embarrassed. And I just thought Kawhi didn't look like he cared. I famously called him Kawit Leonard. The following season, he came back. He was very good. You know, he got us out of that Dallas series and was amazing for it. And, you know, it's funny that a game six in the first round is the crowning achievement of Kawhi Leonard's Clipper career through five years. I thought we were guaranteed a ring, at least one, when we got him. And now, I mean, yeah, I'm thankful for that conference finals appearance. The memories, which were largely made when he wasn't in the lineup, but we wouldn't have done it without him. And I thank him for that. But are we going to really be serious about these following years? Hasn't been healthy when we needed him most? I mean, what? It's There's nothing more Clippers than the guy finally staying healthy, playing 68 games, and then he's not there when it matters most. It's like a sick fucking joke. It's a sick fucking joke. And the worst part about Kawhi is, and what Stephen A. said is true, he is not the, the best guy to be the ambassador of your franchise. He does no fan interaction. He does not show off his personality. He's not interacting with fans on social media. He doesn't say anything. His injuries we don't even know about to the last minute. And he gets just, it, no one knows anything about him. We act like he's a fucking stand-up comedian when he says anything with personality. Oh, he's so funny, guys. I'm so tired of him. I am so tired of having him on my team. I've been tired of having him on my team. I love watching him play basketball, but at the end of the day, he's getting his money and we're just sitting here watching season after season go by and him sitting on the bench in street clothes as we wallow away. It's it's just embarrassing at this point. And I'm not here to just wait another year for the if Kawhi's healthy game. I'm just not. It's a waste of my fucking time. And it's a waste of everyone's time. And, and, you know, Kawhi, and when I talk to Clipper fans about him, it all feels like such a forced love outside of some people. You know, people defend him against Laker fans and all this and like, oh, he's so great. I cannot stand the reverence that people have for this fucker. What has he done for us? You want me to tell you what he's done? He was impatient. We are sunk because of him. We are sunk. He has driven our franchise to the ground. And it's not all his fault. Of course, he didn't expect to get injured. You know what he could have done? He could have not made so many fucking demands and came here and said, you know what? You guys got a solid 48, 49 win team with grit that lacks a superstar. Let me see after one year how far we are from contention and then we'll make moves. He came here when he was like 28, 29 years old. LeBron James is trying to be the greatest player ever and he even gave the Lakers a chance with a young roster to figure out what pieces they wanted to move 
And Kawhi comes here and is basically blackmailing us with the Lakers saying, you better get a second star or I ain't coming. And we give up our whole future. And I don't blame the Clippers. How could you say no to a finals MVP that's choosing to come to an organization that was once the worst franchise in pro sports in America? You can't say no to that. And who does he choose? I was skeptical the second we got him, Paul George. Two straight postseason exits in bad fashion. And all the people that don't truly watch hoop like that and just want to make excuses for stars said it was all because of his shoulders. But all these years later, you see, he does the same shit healthy. Over dribbles in isolation, shoots too many jumpers, and makes horrific decisions. And it causes live ball turnovers that shift momentum. And now all these years later... No one's going to mention that surgery, those shoulders, when we go back and watch that series and see that he did everything that he does right now. Kawhi Leonard made us trade our whole fucking fucking, you know, future because he didn't watch SGA play basketball. He said he didn't watch games. He only watches film. You should have been a bigger uh, Clipper fan that year, brother. You should have watched more games. And you know what? I know nobody could predict that SGA would become this. Nobody could. But we all could see he was going to be good. And one more year could have, could have upped his trade value even more. You know, one more year. We could have been pretty solid that season. Paul George got injured a lot anyway. But instead, you make us trade everything to get you what you want. And ever since that we've gotten this guy, we have bent over for him. We got him as point guard. These two have wanted a point guard from day one. And we have tried all these different fuckers till we've ended up with James Harden. And you know what? It, I'm, I'm just, I'm done, man. I'm done. I'm not going to let away with this guy's generational PR team. Let him skate by and let you guys know what he's been getting away with. This guy walked off the court against New Orleans last year for no reason and then came back the next game. And last season, I said I heard about that, but I never heard secondary confirmation. Let me put it this way. Somebody that is very close to the team told me straight up he left the game. He, with no explanation. And again, last year against Memphis, he sat out in the middle of the game and was like, we're going to play uh, our back-to-back -back for the first time this season, but we're not going to play the second half. You know why Ty Lue was so fucking angry after the game? Because he had no idea that his best player was just going to sit the fuck out. And you want me to have sympathy for him? You want me to... You know, what has he done? He's not a better clipper than Blake or Chris Paul or even Paul George. I am done with him. I am done. Done. And you know what? If he still wears the Clipper uniform, of course I will root for him. Of course. But until I see him play in front of us in a playoff game, I think it's just a waste of time and he is stealing money. And why the fuck did we re-sign him after a stretch? That was good enough for you, you fucking losers. And then all these fans wanted to say I was being a bad fan for questioning it. You guys make me sick. Sorry, I am so sorry that I wasn't sold on his little stretch of being healthy. And now what? And now what? We're stuck. We have nowhere to go. And let's talk about the other reason we're stuck. This excuse-making guy that I now love, but he is excuse-making and is never going to win a championship. So it's not just James Harden anymore. This guy, Paul George, he had, you know, he is an expert at dodging responsibility. That's all he does. He dodges responsibility. First, after the bubble year where he fucking choked and was talking about, oh, my mental health was bad. You know what your mental health was bad, bro? It's never bad when you're winning, right? It's because you were playing like shit and you disabled your Instagram comments because there was nowhere to go and nothing to do in the bubble. So every time you went on social media, you had to face the fact that everyone saw that you were playing like ass and then you got in your feelings about it. And I get it. That's hard. Play better. Cry me a river. You're making 50 M's, bro. And then the next year he comes back and wins our whole fan base over, wins me over. We don't get to see him in the playoffs. I gave him a pass. He has gotten away because of his in, because of the injuries to get away with this shit. In this regular season, he showed me, just like last season, that you just don't know what Paul George you're going to get. You know, everybody thinks, like the, the casual fan just says, looks at Paul George and sees what he can do and says he has no flaws. But when you watch him every night, he has a ton of flaws. Paul, I said James Harden is everything wrong with the modern basketball player. Paul George is also everything wrong with a modern basketball player. He's flashy. When he's on, he looks like an absolute demigod. But the problem is, you got to watch him play. He does not apply his talent. 
but he leaves so much on the table. And I thought Blake Griffin left stuff on the table. Nobody's like him. This guy settles so much for contested jumpers. He'll get the step on his defender and snatch that shit back for no reason. He over dribbles, has a bag that he doesn't even know about. He has such a big bag, he has no go-to move. He has no go-to offense when shit isn't going for him. He routinely shoots himself out of games. He does not lean into posting up and going to the mid-range where he's more effective because he doesn't want to fight for post position. He does not like physicality anymore. He doesn't go to the rim enough. And more than anything, he's a pick-and-choose effort defender. That two-way player shit is a bunch of bullshit. Uh, Half the time, he is not locked in defensively. He's often at fault for defensive miscommunications. And more than anything, he doesn't have it here or here. Heart and IQ. Paul George is not built for it. He constantly deflects. He constantly makes excuses. He said after the bubble that he wanted the ball more. And now after two years, he wants the ball less. He wants a point guard. It's just, you know, any way to deflect criticism. And then Rachel Nichols asked him, does it feel like there's more pressure now that, you know, you're getting older or less? And he goes, no, we put in, I put in the work in the summer and, you know, we live with the results. If you fail, you fail. Are you kidding me, dude? You think you're just like going to waste our time and like us fans are not starving for a ring. You are not starving for a ring. So do me a favor, Paul. I love you to death. I thank you for everything you've done. Don't waste my fucking time. Pack your bags and go to Philly or Indiana. Uh, we will not, you will not be missed. You know, I, I don't give a shit, dude. I'm done. You're unserious as fuck. You were unserious as fuck. A lame excuse for a star. Podcast P. Podcast piss all over yourself when it counts. Wave Sports Entertainment. I'm making a call. I'm trying to get that shit off the air. Ain't nobody trying to listen to your excuses, bro. You know what you're going to say? Oh, we just didn't have it. You know, it sucks that Y wasn't out there. We'll come back next year. We'll get it done. You know, we just got to hope it falls for us, Clipper Nation. We're going to get it right. I'm tired of listening to you talk. You're done, bro. I love you. One of the greatest Clippers of all time. Pack your bags. Wow. Feels like I got everything off my chest there. So, yes, where do we go from here? Guys, I want to blow this shit sky high. We need a full-on rebuild. And I know what you're saying. We have no picks. What are we going to do? Get whatever you can for Kawhi. Find any team that will take him. Get as many picks as you can. Just try to get as many picks as you can. Look, Bones Highland, uh, Brandon Boston, you know, Kobe Brown, Musa, Kai Jones, Zubots. These guys need to be playing and, and be the focal point next year. If you get rid of Harden, maybe we'll have some cap. I don't know what happens to Westbrook. We'll see what he wants to do. Um, But we got to go a different direction. And I know people are going to say, so that sounds like a 10-win team. I don't give a fuck. I want to root for something fun again. I don't care if we suck. And here's the thing. It's going to separate the weak fans that are not here for for the Clippers and the ones that are. The stands will be gone. It'll only be real Clipper fans. And I know the biggest hesitation. But the Intuit Dome, Bomber's never going to do that. Let me tell you something, man. We got to stop living in fear about that Intuit Dome shit because everyone's saying, you're not, you know, no one's going to go to the arena without stars. Who wants to see these stars that don't suit up? You think people are showing up to the games that much for Harden and West? Like Westbrook, maybe he gets a large ovation, but are, did our attendance drastically change when we got James Harden? Like not really. Like I get it. When the Clippers don't have stars, they don't sell out the arena. We have a new stadium coming. We, li- we play in Los Angeles, a basketball mecca. Like we, the LA loves basketball. And it's a brand new stadium. And the Clippers have more fans than people think. Everyone's worried about those. Look, Clipper fans are going to show up no matter who's in the jersey. It's about those other fans, the neutrals that come for a game in the, in the, you know, in the season. You think they're not going to come to a new arena? Like, even if we don't sell out every game, it's not the end of the world. Like, it, it comes down to this with Steve. Balmer is the one that pushed for Harden in the first place. But I think Balmer is starting to get, like... I don't think he understands what it takes to be, win, a, win a championship. He is a tech guy. He's a basketball fan. But he clearly does not know what it's like to win a championship. And he's learning on the fly. But he's making some big mistakes. And his stubbornness and unwillingness to be bad is going to be the death of him. Because what we want, we're going to do is we're going to be that team that doesn't blow it up till it's too late. The next couple of years, you guys want to just listen to, oh, if Kawhi is healthy and, and, and watch these these stars that don't really give a shit about the fans, don't give a shit about winning this team's franchise's first championship that badly, and there's no life. And I noticed, man, the home games in the playoffs were weak. There's no personality anymore in the fans. What has happened to us? I feel like we've only gained more fans. We have sell out almost every game, but the life is gone. You go back to those crowds in Lob City, and they were different, totally different. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what fans are saying, and I see it, and I feel it the same way. We have no homegrown player. 
These guys are all from LA, but no one gives a shit, man. People act like they do, but when I talk to Clipper fans about Paul or Kawhi, it's it's that it's forced worship to me. It's not like Blake. You know, I remember after Chris Paul made that game winner against Memphis in, in 2013. We were walking out in the concessions in the 300 section, and everybody was chanting, CP3. See, like, there was a level of pride we had for those guys. And you know what? I never thought they were going to win the championship, ever. But you know what they did? They were fun. They bled red, white, and blue. They represented the fans well. And they, they were a team we could get behind. And I was willing to lose with Blake every single year. And I don't really give a damn about these guys like that. It's, it's not the same. And I, I envy Denver. I envy Minnesota, Oklahoma City. Like, I'm so jealous of them that they get to root for some homegrown talent that they built. And we have this, this manufactured bullshit. Like, there's nothing natural about this. My, my co-host on, on Four Sportsmen, Fabio, a Knicks fan, he, when he was talking about Kyrie and KD potentially going to the Knicks, he was saying, what do you want to root for? And I once said, I, would, I, would, I don't care what I root for. As long as we win a championship and are good, I don't care. But he proved me wrong. I do care about what I root for. And I would rather, rather root for a 20-win team with excitement than this shit. This expectations to get crashed down and not even see our $50 million guys play. Like, there's no fun in this. It's not, it's not fun at all. It's a complete waste of my time. I can't wait for a rebuild. I can't wait for a new era of Clipper basketball. I can't wait. If it means we suck again, I can't wait till we suck again. Because you know what? I've been here when we sucked. I was here when we had 19 wins. I was here when we had 23 wins. And I will be going nowhere. But I will tell you this. I have to take a stand in some way. And this year, it's, it's been damaging to my mental health. I, I want to tell you guys all this. All the people that are going to say, when I, when I say what I'm about to say, all the people are going to say that you're a fake fan and all this. Well, let me say this. This is all the stuff I sacrificed to do this. I record two shows. When we play a home game and I'm not there, I record Locked On Clippers and I record Dime Dropper to make sure that I have two accounts of everything we're doing. I went to 29 games this year in the regular season and I went to three games in the playoffs for a grand total of 32 games. That's all my money, money for parking, money for drinks, over an hour in traffic. I come home from the game. I'm on Twitter scrolling to see what people are saying. I record the podcast of Locked On and then upload it at like 3 in the morning and then I wake up and do the vlog and edit it at work. All this for a year long, five days a week on the podcast, the vlogs, no one that doesn't get paid like the beat writers do, like no one that doesn't get paid to cover this team does more content than me. No one is more invested in this team than me. I'm at every game loud as hell. Like if you ever want to call me a fake fan, like you sound crazy. Like I invest too much of myself in this team. And here's what the lesson I've learned is. When I, when I saw that video of myself in 2020, as funny as it was, I look at that video and I see a person that like scares me. You know, that was because I didn't graduate from college that year because COVID ruined my graduation. Um, my college experience ended prematurely and I just didn't know what to do. I had no job at the time. And I was just like in a very big conflict of like, I didn't want the bubble to happen because if the Clippers did make the conference finals, I haven't gone through all this pain and suffering to see that happen in Orlando, Florida. And if we win a championship, it's going to happen in Orlando, Florida. Like I, it's like a lose-lose situation for me. And then when we got embarrassed because I had gotten myself to be like, okay, we can't lose though because then the Laker fans are going to shit on me and all of us. And it happened and I exploded like that. I was like, I can never care that much, man. I was literally losing weight. I look like a crazy person. And I mean, I am crazy. I am. I do have my moments of rage, but I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not. I'm not I didn't make this con, con, uh, channel to rage and go nuts whenever we lose. That's just something that people have enjoyed because I have passion, but that's not me. I'm a real basketball fan. Like, I want to talk about the hoops, right? My channel was initially to interview past players and learn about their stories and, and have a timeline of basketball history and then have Clipper and Laker content throughout the year. But since I became the host of Locked on Clippers, I have had and, and have still maintained my dime dropper stuff. I have stopped watching soccer, even though I love the game. I don't get to hang out with friends as much. You know, I I've, don't get to, you know, do my personal fitness goals as much because my time management is still, you know, improving and being worked on. I sacrifice a lot for this team. I sacrificed too much for this team. And the last 21, 2021 and 2022, they reeled me back in. 2023, 
I had such a miserable time, but I realized at the end of the year that like, I can't lose anymore. I've built this following. I get paid now and, and, and the more subscribers I get unlocked on, the more money I'm getting. I'm profiting now when we lose or win. But the crazy part is the more that this happens and the more that I don't like this team and I legitimately don't like this current team. Like I don't like rooting for this team. Sue me. I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it anymore. I don't like rooting for them. But I still am forced to because I'm just that loyal. But the longer this goes on, the more I'm starting to feel more like media and that's like a, it's like a job as opposed to a fan. And when I go to the game, I'm always going to leave it all out there and be loud. But even when I'm sitting there, I don't get nervous for games anymore. I wasn't even sad when we lost uh, a game six. I was like, okay with it. I was like, please, I want them to get embarrassed if the front office makes changes, even though I know they won't. I can't believe it's come to that. But if you ever call me a fake fan, like just know like you sound insane. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into this shit. I care so much. And I want to say like when I, when I made that comment about how I'm winning no matter what now, it's not about the money. It's about all of you. All the people that listen to me, that support me, that came over to the games and said something to me and were in my interviews all year and all 32 of those vlogs. You guys are the reason I do this still. I, I probably would have dropped Clipper. I'd still be a Clipper fan, but I wouldn't make content if it wasn't for you guys anymore. This, it's, not, it's not worth it. This team is too frustrating, and I don't even like the direction we're going in. And we're going into a new stadium that's going to change my life, and I'm not happy about the product we're going to be putting out there if this is the team. Old has You know, the league's getting younger. Want to put this team out again? Okay, be my guest. You're accepting mediocrity because you're afraid to be bad for a little bit. Don't be a pussy, Steve. Because you're, you know, you're not doing anyone favors. And uh, back to the fans, though. Like, I love you guys so much. You're the most loyal fans in the world, and you deserve so much more. And I know I'm going to get so much heat for this video, but I don't really care. This is my honest opinion. And there's so many people on Twitter that didn't show me respect when I first started my platform. And I knew when I first got on there, I was like, man, I see these big platforms. And I'm like, I'm as big a fan of, as all these guys. Like once, once I break out of the scene, everyone's going to see that I'm such a big fan. And they're going to resonate with me. And I'm going to have my own following. And four years later, I do. And, I, and I've done everything I've set out to. And by the time this video is out for a week, I bet you I'll have hit 10K subscribers. And that's a dream come true, man. I mean, I, I, can I really be mad? The main thing I've realized is, despite the fact that this was the hardest year for me as a fan, it was the easiest for, year for me as a human being since I started Dime Dropper because my life is going pretty well now. I can't be too mad. And, and a large reason why we look at sports is because we look at it as, as an escape for our, our lives. And, you know, the more down bad I was in my life, the more I cared about the Clippers. And now that... I'm having a good time in my life. I'm on the road of, you know, really taking that next step in my adult career, meeting all these people. My I can feel Dime Droppers really starting to come around and my Locked On Clippers stuff is doing such great things for me. Like, I'm in a great place right now, man. I'm meeting so many people. I've met so many people. And and I've realized my true passion in this in this life. And it's not to talk about basketball. There's too much negative negativity out there. Too many people commenting on me as a person when they're just listening to basketball takes. And I, I, don't, I don't feel like going through all that. I'm going to do this as long as I, I want to. And when I say this, I mean dime dropper and talking about hoops. But my dream was never to just talk about the Clippers. My dream was to interview players and to learn about them and to learn about the history of the basketball and to document history and talk about the GOATs. And next year, I'm going to be doing more of that. If we run this team back... And, and this is a real statement. You can quote this. You can bookmark it and, and send it anywhere you want. If we bring Harden and Kawhi back, I will not be doing lives frequently next season. It'll be very occasional. I will still keep locked on Clippers for the monetary gain and the, and, the, and the name gain. But I will not be renewing my season tickets. I'll be going to games here and there. I will hopefully try to get a media credential, but I'm not wasting money on it. You're not getting me back. Not, 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 if, you, not if you don't blow this shit up. It's not worth my time. I have a lot better things I can do with my time instead of driving an hour and a half to downtown every single couple times a week. I, I just better uses of my time. Does that mean less vlogs? Yep. Does that mean less lives? Yep. Does that mean less Clipper content? Yep. Sorry. 
Uh, and I love you guys, man. I love you so much, but I got to stay true to this. And I'm, 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 I'm taking a stand. And, and I can't believe I'm doing this, but I am. And this season ticket shit was so much fun this year. I had so much fun with all the people I met. But I didn't like watching the basketball at any point, even when we were winning. I just, I can't watch. I just don't like it. It's stagnant. It's ISO. It's just not me. And uh, I, I like basketball more than the Clippers. And that's what brought me to believe it, and or realize my true vision. This year, I was blessed to coach my sixth grade, my, my middle school and that I went to and, and coached a group of sixth graders. And I've been coaching at the, you know, recreation centers and stuff like that on and off. But, but throughout the last year or two, but man, that made me realize, you know, when I get my own squad and get to build something, that's my true passion, man. Me talking in front of a screen, as therapeutic as it must be for some of you guys, and I love that. I'm not directly impacting your lives the same way I'm impacting kids. You know, we talk about it with Paul George. This game is all confidence. It's all mental. And all kids have is wavering confidence. And I never had somebody that was there for me to, to give me that. And I want to be that person for kids. I want to build team habits. I want to compete, man. I'm too competitive to just talk about grown millionaires and have no control and get so mad about it. I love competing. I'm a competitor. And I love being around a team. And I love playing basketball. And I, and I can't wait for the summer to put the ball back in my hands frequently again and not be so caught up with content. But I want to be a coach. I want to keep on moving up in the ranks. This is not that fulfilling to me. And I realize what my true passion is. And... This is just a side hustle to me now. And I love you all so much, but I won't be renewing my season tickets um, that if we bring this team back. So Steve, you got some big decisions to make. Kawhi Leonard, you sunk our entire franchise with your ridiculous demands. We've given you everything you wanted. We've given Paul George everything he wanted. And both of them have failed to live up to the bargain from a health perspective and a playing perspective. James Harden, I don't want to see you on my team ever again. I respect for what, the, everything you did this year. You were professional. You did your job. I don't think you're going to win shit. Russell Westbrook, you're just so hard to build anything around because everything needs to be your way. I love you to death. But you know what? Terrence, Amir, Zubats, I can't wait to hopefully see you back. Brandon Boston, Bones Highland, everybody else, fuck off. Good riddance, good night. And to everyone else and all the fans, I love you so much to another disappointment.